Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Okay. Hey, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll let our pastor get up here for a little while this morning, and then we'll get back into the singing. All right. Well, Lord, thank you once again today. You've allowed us to come back to this great place again, and I pray right now, Lord, this morning that if you would, if you would bless our pastor, just give him everything that he needs to tell us, Lord, that so when we hear it, Lord, once again, that we'll be equipped to go out and share this with somebody else and help them, Lord, in their life, Lord, that whatever it might be, Lord, that you'll just give us that insight to help them. So we're going to thank you for doing that and then also lord uh as you know you've heard a lot of prayer requests this morning there's people that really need a touch from you today they need to be lifted up lord people that have lost loved ones lord and sick and just all kind of things lord in their lives lord i just pray that you'll just again heal those help those comfort those lord just whatever needs to be done in their life lord so we're going to thank you for that but again today we want to ask you this lord and tell you that we love you and ask if you would forgive us if we failed you anyway lord and we'll ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Amen. Somebody said it three times. That's good. <laughs> By the way, we need somebody saying it three times for those old grumblers who don't say it one time. <laughs> you hit that chord right on time, Miss James. <laughs> By the way, how many are glad that 2013 is over? How many are glad that Jesus is coming in 2014? <laughs> Somebody said, how do you know that? I don't know, but if I believe it, I'm going to keep looking until he does come. If he comes this morning, I'll be great. If he doesn't, I'm going to look for him to come tonight. I do believe, however, and I say this in sincerity, I believe that Christ could come right now. There's nothing scripturally that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture. Now, there are things that need to be fulfilled before the end of the tribulation period, his second coming, but for the rapture of the church could happen at any moment. Just in the, It'll happen, by the way. There will not be any more warning. God's given us all the warning he's going to give us in his word. So it's been said and it's been done. And if you're not ready, guess whose fault it is? Say that word, mine. There we go. And if you are ready, guess who gets the glory? him amen all right by the way happy new year somebody say that we'll get that let's get that out of our system so we won't have to worry about it several things i need you to be aware of this morning i have a sad note to start off with brother steve tully uh whose mother has been going through a lot of difficulty um went home to be with the lord this last night about 10 30 she was at shans going through um, multiple surgeries she had to go through and was didn't make it and so she made it home to be with her lord mm. and uh, so we are thankful that there is a place outside of this life to spend eternity with christ and that's the place the bible calls heaven yep. and i'm thankful that that place is a reality do remember to pray for that family uh, uh, steve's dad has been going through some difficult times also so do remember to pray for for the family as a whole also want to remind you, ladies that are going on the trip to Fitzgerald, yeah, see, I, the only time you get Jamie excited is when you say something she wants to hear. <laughs> Road trip, right? <laughs> they love it. By the way, uh, I, since Connie isn't here, she called me and asked me if she would be sure to let every other late, one of the ladies that want to go be sure and get your money to Sister Donna today, this morning, so that uh, if not, it goes up, and the price goes up. So be sure and get with Sister Donna at the end of the service today and make sure that's taken care of. Uh, don't forget that the ladies' Bible study is supposed to begin on January the 13th, so don't forget that, ladies. We'll be back into that. And, of course, we continue to have our Bible studies uh, here on Sunday night, and 
would be back on. Seems like, man, it's a long week when you don't go to church on Wednesday. How many? <laughs> Good Lord, I feel so backslid on God. I want to go somewhere. And I realize you don't have to be in church to be uh, every every time to to have a spiritual life. But I I'm just weaker than most Christians. I'll admit it. I, my my bucket runs over and then it runs out. So I have to get it refilled more often than most people. So I'll at least admit mine. i got a weakness, and God's the only one that can help me. So don't forget, we'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock, still in the book of John. We'll be back Wednesday night, uh, the Lord willing, at 7 o'clock in the book of John. So don't forget that. Uh, remember, Senior Saints will be held this month on the 28th on Tuesday. So don't forget that and continue to pray for all of our outreaches that the Lord will bless and encourage us. Pray for our missionaries. Um, I did hear, by the way, from uh, Brother Michael over the, from Kenya over the holidays and a lot of people being saved there. He's actually launched out another, mis- another ministry, evangelical ministry, where he's going from town to town to town preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and still trying to maintain the other ministries. I believe Michael feels like I do. The time is short uh, and there are still a lot of people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Um, how many know that one of the m- most important ministries in the church has been missing for a long time, and it's mm-hmm. called the Ministry of Encouragement? And the other side of that ministry is a Minister of Reconciliation. Those two, three things we hope to major on this year, and ho- we've been majoring on them. We're going to do more by grace of God. The first one is ministering on the gospel unto salvation of the soul this year. And I hope that I've always done this, but I want, to be, I want to concentrate more on making sure that every message has enough gospel to save the world in it. And if you miss the gospel here, it'll be because something else happened. I hope that I will never fail to keep the gospel constantly because that's the only thing that will bring a person to salvation. Nothing else will do that. And by the way, all three of these things, salvation, edification, that's building up the church, and restoration, all three of these are built around one primary thing that has to be done, not just by me, but by every believer, and that's being willing to speak the truth in love. The truth is what draws a person to where they need to be, where they need to be reconciled, or where they need to be built up, or where they need to be saved. The truth, but the truth has to be spoken with the desire for that person's betterment. That's called love. So let's remember, make that our, our motto this year, speaking the truth in love. And we're going to be talking about that some more as we continue. And this morning we'll be talking about uh, the primary need of salvation. And I realize that people say, well, well, I'm already saved. Well, let's make sure. How about that? By the way, if you ever had to make sure of your salvation, this is yes and don't lie. Most everyone has to count, and by the way, don't just go back to a day that you made a, per, uh, uh, a public or a private profession of Jesus Christ. You ought to be able to tell by your life today that you belong to Jesus. Amen? So that's what we want to do. We want to make sure it would, it, I don't, most terrifying thing I believe in a pastor's mind is to think that some of the people he's preached to year after year after year still don't know Jesus. That would, who. I don't sleep well sometimes when I begin to think about that. But pray. We have so many people that, uh, that need the Lord in our community, maybe even in our church, but certainly in our world we have people that need the Lord. So remember to pray for each one. Pray for all the sick people. We've got a whole lot of sick people, people that are going through difficulties. But I want to tell you something. If you're a believer, you'll never go through anything without Jesus. He promised. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. And everybody said, Amen. That's Him. Don't forget, be back with us tonight. And if you're visiting with us this morning, let me say thank you for being here. We appreciate you coming. And we'd like to give you a visitor's card, if you would, and have you to fill that card out. And when you exit the building, then the offering plates will be out on the table there in the vestibule. Just drop the card over in that, and we promise to keep your information in-house. So if anyone is visiting, maybe for the first time, would you slip your hand up and let us give you a visitor's card? Anyone for the very first time? Oh, right down here, Brother Silas, sitting right next to Brother Travis. I didn't even know he had a friend, but he's got one here this morning. (laughs) It's a joy to have Sonia with us right here. Right down that road. You're headed in the right way, right next to Travis over there, brother. By the way, we have two old friends that are visiting with us again this morning. So, uh, of course, y'all probably know that, and it's Shane and Miss Shane. 
How's that? It's good to have Shane and him back with us. Of course, it's a joy to have each one of you to see you. Years sometimes people come and, and get a chance to come back by. It's always a joy to see them. So it's a joy to have you guys with us this morning. Let's celebrate the Lord. Amen. All right, gentlemen, come and let's receive the offering to get right on into the rest of the service. One quick thing while they're coming. If you've lost a Chrysler key that looks like this, I have it. <laughs> it's going to go in my lost and found unless I find your car. <laughs> Anybody know? Okay. It's good or, good or bad. All right, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. And Brother Silas, if you would, lead us to the Lord in prayer, please. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, if you'll do this. Everybody stand back up. We'll sing some old songs that you might know, huh? The Unclouded Day. Y'all know that one, right? All right. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. storm clouds rise oh they tell me of an uncloudy day oh the land of cloudless day oh the land of an uncloudy day oh they tell me of a home where no storm home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the uncloudy day. Let me hear you. storm clouds ride. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smiles drive their sorrow all away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again. In that lovely land of uncloudy day, now I want to hear you. Oh, the land of the cloudless day. Oh, the land of an uncloudy day. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. It's going to be a good one. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder-working power in the prayer. 
Hey, you know, because of that blood, this next song, you need to think about it because it's going to be pretty cool. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day. Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day. Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be what a day Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be Amen. Okay, all of our children are released to go back to joy celebration, back to enjoy the gospel according to the word of God given to children. All those kids are having a time going back through there. Sometimes when you're get permission from uh, the teachers back in Children's Church. You ought to visit Children's Church. They're totally uninhibited. I don't need to tell you that. Some of them are your children. <laughs> but they, uh, they just have a good time. They think it's all right to have a good time. And uh, I think that we need to learn some things from them. We still have uh, the greatest reason in the world to be able to shout, to be able to laugh, to be able to cry, and nothing be wrong any time. And that's because of having Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. So this morning we're going to be looking at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And if you want to turn in your Bibles there and beginning in verse 1, we'll be reading down through verse 5. Most of you are aware that Brother John is going to be leaving us this week, going back to Jamaica and we're sure going to miss him. I told him a while ago we were going to have to hire somebody to sit on the front row to amen for me. And uh, But he's been a blessing. And remember to pray for him and his church when he goes back home that God will continue to bless and use, use them for the glory of God and get the gospel to the people in Jamaica. So pray, pray for him. By the way, I have to be honest when I was listening and singing along with this last song that Brother Tony chose and 
Sister Katrina, I couldn't help but think about our little brother Huey up there. He's already enjoying all the good things of God. And I told him not to tell God anything bad about me before that. <laughs> but I think that God already knows about me. But I, I'm glad that there's a place like that, that we can have peace in our hearts and minds, that our loved one is at peace with God. I, you know, I don't understand how people deal with death not knowing that their beloved is dying and going to heaven. So remember to pray for if you've got friends or relatives that may not know the Lord, or maybe you may not know the Lord. i got to say something to you. You need to make sure because, folks, I've said this so often, and I say it in love, there's only two options in death. One is to die and go to heaven because of trusting and believing and living for Jesus Christ. And the second one is to die and go to hell. Now, I realize that there's a lot of people that would prefer not to think about hell. And if we deny it enough, in fact, there was a famous evangelical pastor this past year that was attempting to do away with hell in the Bible. Now, you may do away with it in the Bible, but you won't do away with it because hell is a real place where real people are going that have refused Jesus Christ as your Lord. And it's a, it's a heartache for me to think about that the church of Jesus Christ could actually think about trying to take away what he died to keep us from. And so I, I want this morning to ask you in the first service of this year, to as I read through here, Paul, what he was doing, this was a worldly church. The, the Corinthian church was the most worldly church in the New Testament. They were involved in all kind of sexual immorality. They were involved of all kind of lasciviousness, uncleanliness, idol worship. They were, they were and, and they had been brought out of that in Jesus Christ and then drifted right back into it. Drifted. So he's writing to them in closing, in chapter 13, he's closing his statements to them. And I want to read that to us this morning because I believe the church of Jesus Christ has gotten way more worldly than he's satisfied with. I believe you're so caught up in the world that, and we want to make everything right. What we're doing is okay. But wait a minute. I'm, I am not the final authority. The Bible is. And it's not how I feel or you feel. It's what God says. So if you want to make something right, I would suggest you go to the Bible and see what it says. And then if it says it's wrong, quit. Isn't that simple? Just don't do it anymore. You say, wait a minute, I still want to do it. Why, sure, your flesh wants to do it. That's what your flesh is for. But Paul said that we had to crucify ourselves daily. And anybody that says, I don't ever want to do wrong, will lie anywhere. Everybody wants to do wrong. So, but when you don't do wrong, that's where the power of Jesus Christ comes in as far as believers. Let's read this and see what Paul has to say out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Let me, I want to back up to verse 21. Now, may, you may not have this in, in the last, last verses of chapter 11 because that will give us an understanding of why he's saying this. Verse 21 of chapter, 11, uh, chapter 12 says this, And lest when I come again, Paul is saying to the church there, my God will humble me among you that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented. It's not a matter that they've sinned. It's a matter that they continue to sin and not repent, not turn. And the word repent means to have another mind, change directions, stop what they were doing. You have not repented of the uncleanliness, the fornication, and the lasciviousness which they've committed. Talking about impurity, talking about holotry, and also talking about intemperance. Those were the things that he was talking about. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, This is the third time I am coming unto you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. By the way, that was a standard for the biblical understanding of validating a statement. There had to be two or three witnesses that heard that statement that would be your witness uh, should you ever need to reclaim the, the authority or the validate that statement. And he said, So that every word shall be established. Verse 2. I told you before and foretell you as if, if I were present the second time and being absent, now I write to them which have heretofore have sinned and to all others that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also know we, we also, or we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Then verse 5 is where I want you to rest your eyes and your heart. Examine yourselves. Isn't that a powerful statement? Take a spiritual checkup. 
Not allowing someone else to check you up. Allow yourself to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Let's say this in a colloquial statement. Examine yourself to make sure you're saved. That's what he's saying. And then prove it. Prove yourself. How do you prove yourself? You examine yourself about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You prove it by your lifestyle. So examine it and prove it. Know ye not, know ye not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. The word reprobates means unworthy or not ability without the ability to comprehend. So what Paul does to this church is he says, you know, guys, I love you. I, I want to make sure that you're saved. I want you to make sure you're saved. Examine yourself. Examine your relationship with God. Here's, here's that examination the inward. Do you care more about the spiritual things and pleasing Christ than you do care about pleasing your own flesh? Which one is the predominant factor in your life? And then he says, well, prove that relationship by how your lifestyle is. Do your lifestyle match what God says for us? Which is, the, which is it? Now, remember, Paul is saying this out of a heart of love. Remember, Paul is the one that said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? No, the greatest friend that you ever have is somebody who will tell you the truth in love. Not in condemnation, not in, just, not in attempting to justify themselves by condemning someone else, but because they care about someone. I promise you, God has a desire for the truth. By the way, do you understand that truth is the only thing that's ever brought you to salvation? The truth about Jesus Christ. The truth about who He is. So the idea here is examine your... Now, why is this so important to Him? Well, let me tell you why it's important. Turn to the book of Luke, chapter 16, with me, if you will. The book of Luke, chapter 16... Paul knew, and you know, the results of not being saved is being lost. That's, a, to me, the most awful word in the English language. Lost. Without a Savior. With no hope, no help, doing your own thing with your own life, and then wind up dying too early. Nobody believes they're going to die in the condition they're in right now. I'll have time. Well, believe me, there's no guarantees about time, are they? No guarantee about life or death. And this is a doctrine that's almost disappeared from the evangelical church. It's almost disappeared. We say very little about hell, and if we do, it's usually in cussing. We speak very little about the v validity of hell itself, and yet that we want to readily believe in heaven. But listen, you've got a problem. If you're going to believe what Jesus said about heaven, you're also going to have to believe what he said about hell. One of the two. Make up your mind. He's either was lying about both or he's telling the truth about both. I choose to believe he's telling the truth about everything he put in here. And if you choose not to, then you're going to have to be smart enough to figure out which one's the truth and which is not. I'm not that smart. I'll just take it all. Amen? Chapter 16, the book of Luke. But before we get there, let me, uh, let's look at verse 1 and 2 of chapter 16. Because we need to get a run and start so we can understand why, why he brought this message uh, about this terrible thing at this terrible place. Remember, he had just finished the parables of, of Luke 15 that we just finished preaching on uh, about the lost co coin, the lost son, and the lost sheep. And he talked about those that, had, had, uh, what, that was lost, a lost son a lost coin, and a lost sheep. And he was talking about that. And when he got to chapter 16, verse 1, he said also unto his disciples, and he uses this in two verses, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear of this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. He said this already. Claimed about this scribes and the Pharisees so caught up about money. By the way, this whole parable is about rich people. Look, as he said again in quickly in chapter 14, I mean chapter 16, verse 14 and then verse 15. Let's read that before we get into the text. And the Pharisees also who were covetousness, 
That's the reason. By the way, it wasn't about how much money they had. It was what, that they had the love of money. You see, the, money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. That means that money is your only satisfier. The only reason you keep going. And he said the Pharisees who were covetous heard all these things and they, described, and they derided him, Jesus. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now this lays the groundwork for the heart of the message. He's already warned them. He's given them the wonderful illustration over in chapter 15 of God loving sinners. He gives a wonderful illustration of the parable of, of the son who, got, who, was a story, who was lost and is now found, who repented and came back. And now he gives this illustration that I tell you the reason for your examination this morning is there's a real, literal hell where people go who have refused Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. That doesn't make me happy, but it makes it biblically true. Stay with me. Beginning, if you will, in verse 16 of the same parable. Let's drop down to verse 19, if you would. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Let me hurry to tell you, this is not about being rich and going to hell because you're rich. It's about going to hell because you refuse the Lord of your life to be Christ and decided the Lord of their life was to be money. That's the difference. It's not somebody rich going to hell because they were rich because they refused Jesus Christ. And then he said he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. By the way, this is not a parable. Here's a proper name in it. There's not a proper name in a parable. It's a reality. It was a real story. And even if it wasn't, a parable just is an earthly illustration of a heavenly truth. It wouldn't change anything if it was a parable. But this guy was named Lazarus, and he was laid at the gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now Abraham's bosom is an alliteration to that which was heaven. It was not a waiting place of the soul as is taught in purgatory, but it was a place where the Old Testament saints are going to be, were going to be emptied into what we call heaven once the resurrection of Jesus Christ occurred. But he was sitting in Abraham's bosom, and then the rich man died, the Bible said, and he was buried. And verse 23 to me is the saddest verse in the Bible. He died as everyone will, he was buried or cremated, whatever happens at the end of death for the body. And then look, it wasn't over. And in hell, the word Gehenna is the word here. It's not the word Sheol, which is the Greek word for grave. There are those who teach that hell is just the grave. When Jesus used the phrase here, hell, he was pointing to a place called the Valley of Hinnon, or the word Gehenna. And it literally was a place where fire never ceased, and where people that worshiped idols tossed their children into the fire in order that never quit burning so that they could worship their idols. That's almost beyond belief, isn't it? So is it with hell? He says, the rich man died, and he lifted up his eyes, being in this place called hell. And then here's some things about hell that you need to make note of. And if you haven't examined yourself already this morning, then this is one of the only two options that are left for you and me. And he says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being what? In torments. Pain, excruciating pain. The word carries with it more than a superficiality. It carries with it the idea of a pain unfathomable, a pain undescribable. And he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Can you imagine being in that kind of torment and still being able to see? Being able to see people. Being able to understand that there was a reality out there beyond the reality you had. And when he saw, he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. In this wonderful place 
so opposite from where he was. Lazarus, who had suffered and laid at the gate with sores, now is in a beautiful place where there's no pain. And yet he is in a terrible place where he not only experienced pain, he experienced the absence of what Lazarus had. I want to tell you there's nothing in heaven that's in hell except people. That's the only thing. People are in both places, as he says this here. And in verse 24, the agony in these words, rip it your soul. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Oh, would to God he'd have cried out to God days earlier. For that mercy, mercy literally means don't give me what I have coming. No, I'm not ready for my payday. Have mercy on me. It's an amazing thing. God offered mercy over and over and over in the life of this individual, and yet he refused it because he was too busy doing his own thing. And all of a sudden, he asked for mercy and Send Lazarus, this guy that I didn't want anything to do with. Oh, I really want something to do with him now. Would you just send Lazarus that he may dip? This is unfathomable. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Wow. Have you ever been extremely thirsty where there was no water available? That's an excruciating pain within itself. But to be in just such a place that even a dro- just a, the drop off of a finger would be like heaven. So just, just let him, don't, don't bring a gallon over here. Don't, don't bring a barrel or a truck, no, just a drop. Well, you see, there's a problem. There's no water in hell. And even if it were, it would disappear because of the terrible heat. Someone has once said, and I don't know how these numbers come out, and I almost dare to say this, but someone once said that in hell, the hell degrees in hell would exceed 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know how anyone can tell that. I can tell you this. It's a place that no matter how terrible the heat is, you will not burn up. The agony goes on. The story continues to unfold. And he says, if you'll just send Lazarus. Listen to sadness. I must have been sadness in Abraham's voice. And he said this. And he called him a name of affection. Son, remember. I think one of the most horrible things about hell, you're going to be able to remember some things. You're going to remember, I believe, you'll remember messages like this that prayed on your soul to say, listen, we don't want the teeth of death to clamp your life into a terrible place called hell. That's why we stand before you and even take the possibility of causing you to run the other way. But you must leave. You've got to leave with the truth. And the truth is that hell itself will be a place of memory. And he said, remember, remember, in thou in lifetime, their lifetime, you received thy good things and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. What's the difference here? The difference is Lazarus was a man, not just a beggar. He was using this to show the Pharisees that you can't buy your way into heaven. And neither can you buy your way out of hell. He was giving an illustration to these that depended on finances. That was their world. But there's nothing you can depend on to keep you from hell but the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And so he continued and he says, you know, in your your lifetime, remember this. Can you imagine having remember how you, quote, lived it up and walked right over the beggar? Verse 26 is a terrible verse in my mind when it says, And besides all this, Abraham said, Even if I wanted to send Lazarus to you, I can't. Because between heaven and hell, 
there's a great gulf fixed. That means it cannot be moved. It cannot be changed. It can't be crossed over. They that would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. I was preaching recently in the jail, in Leon County Jail. I had a young man came up to me after the end of the service and said, you mean there's no parole from hell? I said, nope, and there's no probation either, bud. Once you get there, you're there. There's no escape. There's no way out. Every decision has to be made before that time. And everyone that thinks this has a thinking mind must realize what he's telling this story about is because he loved those men that were standing out there that had decided that this was their world, this was their God, this was their desire. They had no desire for spiritual things, and yet hell was going. They were getting what they wanted to have in their lives. And the payday for that is beyond reason, beyond reasoning for refusing Jesus Christ. And he continued and he said this. He said, they can't come from here. And then, of course, he reached a little further. There's got to be a way. I can understand this next plea. Here's the part. That man in hell, in all of his torment, in all of his agony, all of a sudden begins to be concerned about others left behind. Others left behind. Before this, he was only concerned about his life. He wasn't even concerned about the closest man to him, the beggar at his gate. But he said, uh, verse 27, I pray thee, therefore, Father, speaking to Abraham, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. Would you send him because I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. I want to tell you, if the people that were in hell tonight could talk or this morning could speak, everybody sitting in here would get a message from somebody there, for God's sakes, don't come to this place. That's what he was saying. Please, go tell them. Uh, send Lazarus there to tell them. Well, you know, it sounds to me like a, a heart that was... Now penitent, uh, now that understood the terribleness of, of what the decisions he'd made, and now he realizes all my decisions are done. No more opportunity for decisions. What a heartache. What a thought. Five brothers, and I believe in his own mind, maybe even his father. He said, go to my father's house. I've got five brothers that are headed to hell wide open and tell them about this place. I wonder how many messages have been preached across this country to people about the reality of hell. And people ignore it and say, oh, well, I'm not worried about it. I even had a young man tell me, oh, that's hell's where I want to go because that's where all my buddies are. And I had the sad message to tell him, there's no friendship in hell, son. There's no friendship there. All they are is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Falling constantly. The Bible, the Bible makes it plain that it's just like a falling in a pit, burning every inch of the way, and yet it's an amazing thing. Hell is a place of darkness. The fire is black fire. Falling constantly. No way of stabilizing any of those things. And yet, being able to feel the torment of the soul and the body and the flesh forever and ever and ever and ever. Someone said, some psychiatrist said, well, the mind would eventually just be gone. It couldn't. God's not going to let the mind be gone. The mind's going to have to experience everything in hell. He said, don't let them come to this place of torment. He recognized, understood, he felt that. And I'm convinced that if we could just spend a minute, if God could roll back the earth enough so that we could just look or smell the flesh of the burning fire that comes up from hell's portals or take a glimpse of at the human torment that's going on, there's not a one here that wouldn't be at this altar this morning crying out to God for salvation or either for someone they know that needs salvation. It wouldn't just 
go away. And I prayed that God will let every true believer understand that we've got loved ones that are dying and going to hell. And we've, you know what the devil's done? He's let a lot of us Christians ruin our testimony to people we love by the way we live so that the words we say have no power. We've lost that part. And this man understood it. And listen to what he said to him back. Abraham said unto him, and I believe this was almost like with tears in his voice. It had to be. When he said, they, those five brothers you're talking about, son, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Word of God. Let them hear them. Let them hear what the Word of God says about this. Let them hear just like you heard and chose to ignore. Let them hear and not ignore and turn their lives so that they won't have to be told in hell that they need to repent. Repentance is too late now. And he said, he continued. And he said, but nay, Father Abraham, if, if one went unto them from the dead, in other words, from this place, they will repent. Surely, God, if you let Lazarus go back, and, or, or I know what he was thinking, let me go back. I want to go back. I want to tell them. I, 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 can be a, I can be a witness. Now, I want to say something to you. It's too late to be a witness for the salvation of Jesus Christ once you're in hell. There's no opportunity for witness there. <laughs> How sad that so many paid no attention to the realities of what God has planned. And He's told us from the very beginning. You do realize this is in the same book that says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but to be given eternal life. The gospel has in it the options and the results. Perish forever in hell or live forever with Jesus Christ. And yet, for whatever reasons, I've had, wow, mm, I've had people look at me and laugh when I'd mention hell. You believe that? I can't laugh about hell, friends. I want to weep when I talk about it. I don't think it's something to joke about. I don't think it's some little byword. I heard someone say the other day they were in a bad situation. It was terrible. I, and I've forgotten exactly what the situation is. And they said, we're living in hell right now. And I wanted to say, you have no idea what you just said. We can't possibly on this side of this except by understanding what God said here. And he said, but if they just let somebody go from here. Well, I want to tell you, this morning I'm telling you how he felt. I'm telling you his experience. I'm telling you what Jesus put in the Word of God so that you don't ever have to go to this place, but you better examine yourself to see where you are. And don't base it on some kind of empty profession of faith you made 20 years ago. How are you living right now? Right now. That's what counts. What I did and who I was is not what God wants to hear. Where are you now? And he said unto him, closing the whole statement, and I can... I can feel this man's heart. Can you? Please, don't let him come to a place like this. And he said unto him, But if, Abraham said, They hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hell is a place of continual torment and pain. 
a place where there's never any peace, there's never any joy, there's always pain and agony. And I believe the memory is the worst thing to me when I would see the memory of things, opportunities I'd had to give my life to Christ, opportunities when somebody loved me enough to tell me the truth about my life and about what's going on with me and loved me enough to keep me to try to go into this place and I'm going to have to remember that. And then I'm going to have to remember those that are on this side of life that are headed exactly where I am. What a terrible, terrible way. Let me say something to you. I have often wished in my flesh that this portion of the Scripture would have been hid in some sense. Maybe even eradicated because even Christians who are dedicated to the Lord get very, very uncomfortable even at the mention of a literal hell. But the truth is, there is a real hell. And even as we sit this morning in a place like this, there are real people dying and going there. The only reason for me to say what I've said this morning is it's truth. That's the first thing. The second thing, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that has any doubt at all about their relationship with Jesus Christ, that they would examine themselves today and settle the issue. Here's why. Death is one breath, one heartbeat away from everybody in here. That's all it takes. One heartbeat. So often over the past few days, I've heard of people dying. One young girl Brother Travis just brought it. Was, my wife told me about it. He put it out on Facebook or somewhere where this young girl went in, had a had cold or something, turned out pneumonia, wound up being in the ICU and just overnight. We know those things happen. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. There's no guarantees that you'll have another day to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Not one. But I pray that this reality will stay. If you're a Christian this morning and you know you're a Christian, let me ask you this question. Is your testimony and your lifestyle such that would bear witness to the fact that Jesus Christ changed it? He not only changed your destiny, He changed your life. I want to tell you there's nothing in the world that would make the Lord, that would, I believe, that would, can I say make the Lord happy? I, I'm going to say it anyway. And to see His children. John said it this way, and nothing makes me happier than to see my children walk in truth. Please, please carry the gospel to the people you love first. Every year, I try somehow to sit down with every child and every grandchild that's old enough to understand and make sure they understand the gospel. I can't get saved for them. I can't make them get saved. But I can keep telling them how. And I can keep weeping over them and praying, loving, and believing that maybe God will open the ears so they'll hear the Word of God and repent and come to Christ Jesus. If you're in this room this morning and you don't have certain assurance that you're on your way to heaven, I wouldn't leave here until I made sure that was settled. You say, how can I do that, Pastor? Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Give Him your life. Don't make a deal with God. He's not in the deal business except this. He says, if you'll give me your life, I'll give you mine. And that's salvation. Would you stand, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If the Lord's spoken to you this morning about your relationship to Him, I beg you, don't leave here without making sure where you are. There'll come a day that your life will be gone, over with, at least as far as this earth is concerned. But let me remind you, every person in here is going to live eternally somewhere. Somewhere. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, 
I'm not sure about my relationship with God. I'm not certain that I'm saved. I'm not certain that I'm going to heaven. And for God's sakes, I don't want to go to hell. Would you please pray for me? Would you slip your hand up right where you are? Nobody's looking but me and you and God. Would you slip it up? Thank you for your honesty, young lady. Thank you. You can slip your hand down. And thank you, sir, for your honesty. I appreciate your honesty. I can tell you today that if you give your life to Jesus Christ, you'll never have to worry. Hell will never be in your mind again if you're a Christian, if you're saved and you know you're saved. How many are in this building this morning that will say, Pastor, pray for me. My life will be what it ought to be so I'll be a better witness for Christ. Would you pray that? All over the building. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty and your desire. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate you. Father, I love you this morning. And I thank you for people who want the truth. God, no matter what it says, as long as they know it's your truth. God, would you help us today? Lord, we are so weak and we need your help so bad. And Father, I think of that man in hell that you let speak so that we can still hear his desire to see people saved. I pray we'll have that desire at Bible Believers Fellowship to see people come to you, Father, and miss the terribleness of hell. And now, Lord, I leave it in the hands of those that we've shared the message with between you and them and ask that you deal with hearts according to your will. And we'll give you praise for what you do. In Jesus, in Jesus' name. Would you look at me just before we leave? I want to ask you, if you would, to pray. I have some children that I'm afraid are not, not Christians. I have some grandchildren that I'm afraid don't understand salvation yet. And sometimes it's hard to go to sleep when you got that in your life. Say, Amen? When you don't know that people you love so much. And I have some that claim to be Christians and yet their lifestyle says everything different. I am not their judge. But I am concerned when there's no fruit of the Spirit in a human's life. I worry about the Spirit of God being in their life. My concern is just that. I hope yours is that. And I pray that you won't leave here without having a deeper burden for people who need Jesus. Brother Bill Wheat, you dismiss us in prayer.